thank you for joining us here at the Park Alive Vision Ministries and Blossoming Place Academy. Each Friday evening at 8 p.m. Eastern Time, we present to you Discipleship Coaching 101. Psalm 16 and verse 11 says, Thou wilt show me the path of life, and thy presence is fullness of joy, and at thy right hand are pleasures forevermore. God wants to reveal his path for your life today. As disciples, consider God's design for your life, for it's the perfect design. Thank you for supporting our online ministry from week to week with your presence. For further support, visit us at www.blossomingplace.com. Yes, that's www.blossomingplace.com. And press that donate button at the top of the landing page. Or connect with us via our email address at theblossomingplace at gmail.com. Yes, that's theblossomingplace at gmail.com. We would be more than happy to send you additional information as to how you can partner with us in this ministry to accomplish the mission here in the Bahamas and around the world. Your cheerful contributions assist with support of our educational scholarship fund, our community outreach programs, and ongoing training discipleship programs in the vineyard, both locally and abroad. Once again, thank you for joining us this and every Friday night for Discipleship Coaching 101. Let's stay connected and remember, your growth continues now. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another exciting episode of Discipleship Coaching 101 with Dr. Paul on call. This is a, the day that the Lord has made. And let us rejoice and be glad in it. Well, tell somebody that we're on the air. Uh, help them to connect with us as we help you to be all that God wants you to be in his vineyard. Yes, um, we are chosen by God to be his hands, his eyes, his feet, uh, his instruments in this world of sin to help people to come to know Christ, home to know is life eternal. And so I welcome you um, this uh, Friday evening. Uh, my goodness, uh, another month is almost gone. And um, July is just almost out the, the door and August is about to roll around. So people will start, uh, you know, being involved in getting ready for school and all that kind of stuff. And so uh, time just marches on, but it also reminds us that uh, we need to be ready for in such an hour as he, as we think not, the Son of Man will come and he will not tarry. And when he comes, he's coming to bring his reward with him to give every man according as his work shall be. So we want to encourage you to be ready. A part of being uh, ready for Christ's coming is to be engaged in sharing uh, Jesus Christ in the marketplace, wherever you might be, um, however God chooses to use you. And so that's what discipleship coaching is all about. And so we welcome you. We trust that you will be excited tonight about what is happening. We have a very special guest that we're going to introduce you in a little while. But while we wait for that, let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. And then we're going to have our Sabbath welcome and then our special item of music this evening. Would you bow with me as we pray? Heavenly Father, uh, today is just another day that we've been given to live for you and to abide in you and to share Jesus with those with whom we love. We would see Jesus. We want you to come and come soon. Take us out of this world, of uh, this messy, messy world, but we want as many of us to be transformed, our lives to be to be hid in Christ, and so we're doing everything that we can to make this happen. Bless us now tonight here on Discipleship Coaching 101 as we share the love of Jesus and share principles and ideas about how you can uh, be a disciple for Christ. Thank you, and we ask that you bless uh, our setting and sitting tonight. Uh, be with the technology and all of those who are helping to make this possible. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. And amen. And now here is your Sabbath welcome and blessing tonight. Engraved in the fabric 
of time, the Sabbath is God's gift for rest. Each Sabbath, God comes down to rest with us. Happy Sabbath rest, my friend. sought the Lord and he answered me he delivered me from every fair those who look on him already heard they'll never be ashamed they'll never be ashamed this poor man cried, and the Lord heard me, and saved me from my enemies. The Son of God surrounds his hand.
the Lord is good. He give you everything. He give you everything. Amen. Let us glorify the Lord. And exalt his name. The big, big sounds there of the 12th graders of the Grand Bahama Academy of a year or two ago. And Derica, uh, who has coordinated and produced that video. Um, it's just fantastic. Talented group of young people with a youth leader there with them. And we just uh, enjoy listening. And that ministry was powerful. Powerful, powerful. Well, tonight we are delighted to have with us a good friend of mine, um, a fellow soldier of the cross, Dr. Roland J. Hill, I think. Is, is it Jay? Yes, it's Jay, sir. Yes, yes, yes. Good to have you with us. Coming all the way from Huntsville, Alabama, um, there uh, at the site of Oakwood University. And uh, welcome to Discipleship Coaching with Dr. Paul on call. Good to have you. Welcome, Doc. Well, thank you. I'm excited about being with uh, Dr. Paul on call. I like that, brother. <laughs> and that awesome. quiet man, they are powerful, brother. Yes, I, I tell you. I really uh, enjoyed it. When I got that video today, I, I, I sent to the producer of it, and I said, listen, man, I need some more music for my program. And she sent me about five videos. Mm -hmm. And that one... Um, uh, I chose to, to come on this evening. That, that That's our, um, they were the high school uh, graduating class, I think about two years ago, at least a year or two years now. And um, amazing, you know, I mean, um, that's almost like the original. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's award winning, brother. I'm telling you, I was really impressed. Yes, yeah. So uh, we're just glad that they're willing to to use their talents for the Lord. Tonight, we're going to be talking about prophecy. Um, the Adventist Church has been known as a church of prophecy. And um, uh, it's uh, something that is a part of our fabric and uh, helps to identify who we are. I was talking with, a, um, uh, I was in a setting just last week and um, um, in church, actually, we were having communion last Sabbath at one of my churches, and um, um, there was a testimony period. And a young lady um, raised her hand. Um, she's actually she was actually a visitor at church, and she said that uh, her testimony was that she was happy for the prophetic books, and that you know a lot of people are afraid of them, you know, Revelation and. And that kind of thing. And so they, they, they kind of stare away from reading them. Um, and, and it's interesting because that's what we're going to talk about this evening, Dr. Dr. Hill. Um, do you find, uh, as a former uh, professor uh, of, of theology at Oakwood University and a pastor, uh, how has it been your experience in terms of prophecy? What are people feeling about prophecy today? Um, in, 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 in your thinking? Well, I think people are still very interested in prophecy. In fact, uh, prophecy books are still one of the number one selling books of all time. And that's because people are always interested in what the future holds. And they want to know, maybe not about what God is doing, but what is going to happen in the future. But also, what about God's plan for them or the plan for them living now in anticipation of the end of the age. Yeah. You know, um, I was in my devotion this morning. Um, the, we were, uh, we, we, we have a section from the old Testament and the, the new Testament and the old Testament reading with, there was a passage in, in Psalm that where, um, David predicted the death of Christ as a prophet, he was acting in a prophetic role um, in that passage, in that chapter this morning. And uh, he was able to predict exactly how things would happen, how people would, would, would treat Christ and, and that no bones would be broken and, and all this kind of stuff. And so, um, yes, uh, but you, you say people are interested in, in more so 
what the future holds about rather than what it says about Christ? Did I hear you say that? Yeah, people, you know, we actually are living in a post-mortem age when people aren't that biblically literate any longer. You know, teaching at the university for a number of years, I found out that there were many, many students that uh, probably have attended church but never really got into Bible study. So, you know, your course on discipleship is really critical because we live in an age when people just don't know the Bible. They don't understand what God has to say about what the future holds and even how to live today. And as a result, they have this stirring in their spirit, but they don't even know what the stirring is. They have these questions about the unknown, which could be the future or just the next day. And they really don't have a place to find answers. So curiosity has them searching in various places looking for answers. And prophecy becomes one of the places where we can provide answers to people who have questions about the uncertainty of the future or the days ahead. And so this is a good um, avenue to actually seek to engage people in um, to, to, to help them to understand that prophecy and uh, um, the, the prophetic books in the Bible are nothing to be afraid of. As that young lady said, that um, she, because people made it look like it was something to fear, is what kind of drove her to, to, to want to understand more about prophetic books. And um, how, how do we help people with this fear? Well, the first thing, we have to be honest about how we have presented prophecy. Uh, the first thing that um, caught my attention as I've been studying through the years is that prophecy is not resigned to two books of the Bible. Let me back into that again, because much of what we talk about in prophecy is talked about from the books of Daniel and Revelation as if they're the only prophetic books of the Bible. Mm -hmm. And the truth of the matter is that the whole Bible is prophecy because prophecy is simply God's revelation of his dealing with mankind in preparation for his soon return and how he would respond to man as they move into the future. So prophecy begins in the book of Genesis and goes all the way through. You just uh, talked about David's prophecy about the first advent of Christ and his crucifixion. That was all in the book of Psalms, so that everywhere through the Bible, we have to show people that God is making a prophetic uh, message for all times. And not, by the way, not just for the future in eternity, but our future for even time. And that's what the question is for many people today. What is my future five years from now? What is going to be like 10 years or 20 years now? What's going to happen when they reach? I hesitated because I'm going to say something. Uh -huh. Reach the age where I am, where I'm now crossing the Rubicon of promise. You know, God promised us six score and ten, and I'm crossing that this year. I like that that word Rubicon. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, you know, I had to think of a nice way to think about hitting 70, brother. Yes, yes, yes. Right. So now they're looking down the road and said, now my parents are aging out. What is it going to look like for me when I reach my parents' age? And what does God have to say or what will it look like? And so prophecy becomes a good place to help them see God's concern, one, and then God's participation in the future that we have now, not just in eternity. And I think when I think about the passage in Psalm, um, I'm trying to remember which chapter it, it is, um, that it also helps to build confidence. And I think one of the things that I, I in, in talking with you in the past, um, you, 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 you're, you're on a mission to help people to see prophecy in a positive light. That's correct. In a positive light because... Um, some people have, have had a negative uh, orientation to, to prophecy. And maybe that's the plan of the, of the enemy, um, to do that, to keep us from uh, accessing the, the wonderful um, lessons that have been posited in prophecy. 
You know, that's really a, a door that you open that gets me passionate. Tell us. Because what we've done is we presented prophecy as propaganda rather than empowerment. And what I mean by propaganda, I mean it has a purpose of bringing people to our way of thinking rather than freeing them to think the thoughts of God. God aligned and brought prophecy as a means of giving us the freedom to trust him for our future and to see him as sovereign God. Much of prophecy is presented where we have our eye toward the sinister works of the enemy as if the sovereign God has given over power and dominion to the evil forces. And the truth of the matter is that God has been sovereign and prophecy is confirmation that he is a sovereign Lord. And so teaching prophecy in a way that helps people to focus, I like to say, be on God watch rather than the devil watch. I'm not on the devil watch because Revelation chapter 12 says the devil was kicked out of heaven. And since he was kicked out of heaven, that means he's a, a defeated foe. So why should I concentrate any of my efforts or messages on a defeated foe? And that's what the Bible is literally saying. The first, the first prophecy is in Genesis 3.15. After Adam and Eve had sinned, and God said, now I'm going to step in. And I'm going to speak directly to the enemy. I'm going to tell him that you are a defeated foe, that you may work for a while. But from the very beginning, I want you to know that you did not win. And I want Adam and Eve to know that I've made provisions for them to be victorious now on this planet and prepared for eternity. Amen. In fact, let me say this. You see, when we think of prophecy, and this is where, uh, Dr. Paul, this is where we missed it, I think. We resign prophecy to the books of Daniel and Revelation, and I truly believe in them. But what happens when you do that, you miss out on the mother of all the prophecies, which is Genesis 3.15. Every prophecy of the Bible comes out of the mother prophecy in Genesis 3.15. So when we understand that, God declares and decrees from the very beginning, I'm the sovereign Lord and the devil is defeated. So that when I see any prophecy anywhere in the Bible, I'm actually uh, encouraged to see God as the sovereign God. So, so what I hear you saying is... Uh, Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15 sets the foundation for all other prophecies. That is correct, sir. And in that foundation is the promise that God is victor. Yes. And he is the uh, purveyor of our success. Through him, we, we have victory as well. That's correct. And, and that the devil is a defeated foe. So uh, are you saying then that every prophecy then uh, pivots from that? That is correct. And if we don't use that mother prophecy, then we end up moving toward a pessimistic view of prophecy, giving the enemy some type of power that God had already taken from him. I mean, just think about it. He was kicked out of heaven. And only one third of the unnumbered force was kicked out with him there are two thirds of an unnumbered force that's still working on our behalf. Mm -hmm. So when I think of prophecy and, and we're told that all heaven has been committed for our salvation and our protection and our prosperity. So if I have two thirds of an unnumbered number on my side, plus God, why should I be worried about what the devil is doing or any evil person? Is doing? Yes. Um, I'm just looking at the passage here. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in verse 15, it says, and, and I, well, verse 14 says, And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between mm -hmm. thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his feet, his heel. And so God has made that promise that, listen, I got you. That's correct. I got you. You don't have to worry about a thing. You just 
abide in me and the devil is taken care of from the very beginning. And, 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 it, and, and some people might think that God was caught off guard by, <laughs> by this, you know, but from the foundation of the world, the God, had, mm -hmm. yeah, he had made provision for this. Now, I know uh, some years ago, uh, maybe a year or two, even during the pandemic, um, we had started talking about this a little bit. And um, you told me you were writing. <laughs> you were writing. And I know you like to write. I um, love writing. Tell, tell, yeah. tell us how have you, uh, this, this whole matter of, of pr uh, purposeful prophecy um, taken a hold of you? And, and where has it driven you to? Well, I've been struggling with the prophetic message and messages that have been preached, not only in our faith community, but in other faith communities. Uh, reading the books and, and preaching prophecy myself, I begin to have a real concern about, is it really speaking what God wants us to know about prophecy? And then I thought about some of the prophetic messages that I personally preached and how they affected my decision process. Because at the end of the day, whatever we believe in prophecy affects our behavior, it affects, affects our decisions. And so I saw some of the decisions that I made in my young years because I accepted a view of prophecy that wasn't as accurate as it should be. Now, let me make it clear. I believe that our brothers and sisters through the years have sought to give as much truth to prophecy as possible. But what I've understood about the Bible and Bible study is that we grow in our knowledge of truth. Well, I, the Bible I, says that, isn't it? That the path of the just is as a shining light that's that correct. grows more and more until the perfect day. No, no, no. I, I like the way you said that, Dr. Paul, because what happens is as we've grown in our understanding of God, we haven't allowed our prophetic views to travel with it. And so I was, a, I was part of a, an understanding of prophecy that was great for a season. But God says, I don't stand still. My people are dynamic. They don't stand still. And truth is progressive. I used to give this uh, illustration when I was a, a professor at the university um, I would say teaching a religion class, I would say, you know, when I was a little boy, there was a, a coffee table in our living room. And man, that coffee table looked to me like it was huge. I mean, like huge. I used to get under it during the storms to be protected from the storms. And then I'd play on top of the table when my parents weren't there. And I call myself the king of the mountain standing on that table. When I was a little boy, three, four, five, six years old, I could stand on the table. But now, going back home, and I was 19, 20, 21, that table looks so small. Did the table change? And the answer is no. My growth in physical body changed, and my view of the table changed, but it didn't change. So it is with truth. Truth is going to always be truth. But as we grow in God, our understanding of truth gets better. So coming full circle to this prophetic word, I begin to ask some of the deeper questions. What did Jesus actually say about how it would look when he returned? And one of the texts that bothered me over and over again was in um, Matthew 24, around verses 28, 29, 30. He says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it also be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. They were eating and drinking and giving in marriage until the day that Noah went into the ark and the door was shut and they were lost. And then I read in Luke chapter 17, where Luke added the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. He says they were eating and drinking and giving in marriage. And then he added they were conducting business until the fire came down, consumed them, and they were lost. So I was asking my question, myself this question through the years. Because when I look at that text, it looks like pretty regular days. In fact, it looked like prosperous days. And for, I'll have to be honest, honest, Dr. Paul, it was like 30, maybe 35 or 40 years. That text was bothering me because I know what we, 
we taught uh, in Matthew chapter 24, verses 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, down to 7, when we talked about wars and rumors of wars. But the deeper I studied Matthew chapter 24, I began to see that Jesus was answering the text, I'm sorry, the question of the disciples about the destruction of the temple. In Matthew chapter 23, the very end of the chapter, Jesus says, this temple that took 40 years to build, that you're worshiping, that you believe is the house of God and nothing could ever happen to it, your religious idol, God is going to take it down and not one stone will be left on top of another. And when he left the audience, he, the disciples came and the word says, chapter 24, verse 1, he spoke to them privately, answering their question. And then that's when he said there would be wars and rumors of wars. He was literally talking about the destruction of, the, of Jerusalem in AD 70. He was giving a prophetic voice about what Israel was going to experience. And if you remember, the disciples were struggling with Jesus's first mission in his first advent. They didn't even realize he was going to the cross at this time. So why would he in that answer to the question, be focusing on what we would consider the end of time or the eschaton. The eschaton for the disciples were at the end of that particular age. So in my effort to understand what it would look like, I started putting together the passages because good hermeneutics, and that word means good interpretation of the word of God, means that I look at the text of the Bible and see how it runs the thread throughout the Bible. So I ended up going back to Revelation, and I believe in the prophecies of Revelation and Daniel. In Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 through 22, what Jesus clearly said to us through the writings of John was that the last days would be days of prosperity. Let me say that again, because it's totally different than what I understood before. He said that the struggle of the... And at the end of the age would be, people would be increased in goods and have need of nothing. There is not one indication of persecution in it at all. It is a sign of prosperity. And one of the greatest struggles in the Christian church in, the, in these last couple of generations is not persecution, but how do I live in prosperity? Your children, my children didn't have to grow up with any real struggle, brother. They had cell phones and they got to go to private schools and they go to, on planes. And so they've grown up in prosperity. And our prophetic message doesn't speak to this generation because they're not looking at beast and all of that. They're trying to figure out how do I trust God in the midst of prosperous times. So it led me to do the study that I've done, and it took me about 25 years to really come to some conclusions and actually, I'll have to say it uh, clearly, uh, feel, here's the word, feel courageous enough to give to the world what I believe God wants us to give. By the way, I don't believe in any private interpretation of the Bible. Anytime anyone comes up with a word and nobody else is saying it, then you know that's not from God. But over the years, I began to hear God speaking a similar word to other theologians, other pastors, other people who were talking a different way of looking at prophecy. And it was beginning to sound so familiar to what God had been given me. So then I just sat down and began to do some serious study. One year, I took the time to study the two true companion books of Old Testament prophecy. And that's the books of Jeremiah and Daniel. Yeah, I'll say it again. Yes. Jeremiah and Daniel. You see, Jeremiah was the prophet God chose, the major prophet, that is, because there were other prophets that spoke to Israel. But he was the major prophet that prophesied Israel's 70-year stint in Babylon. And he was the prophecy that kept him encouraged during the 70 year, 70 years in Babylonian captivity. And I took a year and a half to study these two books side by side and then write notes. Okay. And then what I wanted to know is how did Jesus himself respond to 
prophecy as the one who gave it and then who came to live out the prophetic message. Mm -hmm. So I spent another year studying the four Gospels and looking at how Jesus himself responded to prophecy and how he presented prophecy. And then I took another year out to study after the revelations came about how the end time will be more prosperity than persecution. I was sent by God to study the book of Deuteronomy. So I spent another year studying just the book of Deuteronomy, probably wrote about a hundred and no, 293 half sheets of, of, of notes that informed how I would end up writing this. In fact, I did not really plan to do any real writing on it because it was so new to me. Um, but then as I began to study, God says, you're going to have to write this. So that's how I ended up getting into this, this uh, area of prophecy. It was more out of a deep concern for my own personal soul. And then as a pastor, because that's what I am at heart, I was called to be a pastor at age six. All I've ever wanted to be is a pastor. And even though I've done professorship, I've done lectures all over the world, at my heart and core, I'm a pastor. And I was concerned about these members on the front line who needed a prophetic message that spoke to them right now. And not just about eternity, but how do I form a prophetic message that allows them to live up to their potential in the here and now in anticipation and preparation for the coming of Christ? Great. So um, as we as we we think about that living and that's 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 a concern of, of many people. Uh, I mean, we see it every day in our churches when people are struggling um, and can't make ends meet. Um, uh, we, we are called as a church to help them to um, just survive. Uh, as a matter of fact, many of our churches are, are now... Um, pivoting to that kind of, uh, of attitude where the churches are open 24-7, um, just helping people to get from day one to day two. And is that really how God wants us to live? Um, the, 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 the blossoming place is, is all about helping people to understand who they are in Christ and, and maximizing their potential. Um, so that so that they can be a blessing to themselves and a blessing to others, you know. So, um, so so you wrote all these notes, uh, Deuteronomy and Jeremiah and and Daniel. So, I, I, so where are the notes? What, what what have you done with them? <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, <laughs> I ended up putting them in book form. Okay, and uh, the series is entitled. It's a four book series. They come together. And the title of the series is Positive Prophecy in a Negative World. Positive Prophecy in a Negative World. Positive Prophecy in a Negative World. And the title came as I thought about how negative prophecy is. You know, one of the best-selling books or a series of books of all times and best-selling movies of all times was the series Left Behind. Okay. And it, it presented a picture of the end time as... It's far more different than what the Bible was teaching. All right? And it, it, it is frightening the way we present and where others have presented the close of Earth's history, as if there's going to be all of this tumultuous type of situation. And I've had to rethink that. And, and as I rethought it, God gave me the idea that I'm a positive God. I'm a God of abundance. I'm not a God of scarcity. And you said it earlier, sin did not catch God off guard. He knew that we would sin before he created us. So prophecy is saying, I knew you would do what you did before you did it. And so I've already had, I already have a plan for you to not only be saved, but to thrive. Uh, I like your term blossom place and the blossom now as an evidence of my sovereignty. Let me say that again. You see, God's plan for us, John 10, 10, is to live the abundant life. 
He says, the thief comes but to kill, to steal, and destroy. But I come that they may have life and life abundantly. And the abundant life is not something reserved for eternity. That's now. And God says, I put a hedge of protection around my people as an evidence that I'm, in, I'm the sovereign God and I can bless and prosper you even in these days and in these times. So maybe that's why um, John in, in um, First John, uh, he says, I wish above all things um, that you prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. And uh, the, the, in order for the soul to prosper, um, what, what, what needs to take place? Well, that's an interesting. It's third John, third John two. Third John, yeah, yeah. And what what John was actually saying is that God created us as whole beings, and as whole beings, one area of our life can't be diminished without the diminishment of the others. And God says, when I bless you spiritually, I'm blessing you in all areas and aspects. Of our lives. But what the enemy has done, he's sown Greek philosophy that has actually taken the Christian church, church hostage. And part of the idea of a Greek philosophy is the separation of the body into different compartments. And God said, no, I created you as whole. In Genesis chapter two, when he breathed into man the breath of life, man became a living soul. That meant everything about him is whole. So when John speaks about I want you to prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. He was speaking as a disciple of Christ who understand, understood God's holistic view of prospering mankind. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, it seems very, I don't know, difficult to, well, let me ask it this way. How do we get um, people to... To, to delve into the word so that these nuggets of truth can become real to them and they can move from, from a, a place of perverted thinking, uh, poverty thinking, to a place of, of, of maturing in Christ and blossoming in Christ so that they, they can begin to, to realize what God has um, provided for them. Because there's so many of, of our people that um, just kind of lagging behind. You know, we're creatures of thoughts, okay? Our thoughts impact how we behave and how we prosper and thrive or how we don't prosper and thrive. And that's why I wrote the books and that's why I encourage everyone to buy see this series of books, Positive Prophecy in a Negative World, because each one of them drills down to help change the thought patterns. Because when you've been hearing a prophetic message that's been negative, it downplays God's plan and his provision for us it's very difficult to hear something differently. So you have to read it different. The first book, Positive Prophecy in a Negative World, talks about God's thoughts toward you. Jeremiah 29, 11, which is the text that I based all of the books on. And it's actually talking to people in captivity. And he says, I want you to know my thoughts toward you are always good and for your good and prosperity. And that's where we need to start. We need to say that God's thoughts to us are the same throughout all of our lifetime. In our, our circumstances. It doesn't. It has nothing to do with our circumstances. He knew that we were sinful when we came into the world. But he says, my thoughts toward you are the same. I want you to know I think highly of you. I want you to prosper. And listen to this. I want you to prosper in the most difficult circumstances in Babylon. 
as a testimony that even in Babylon, I'm in control. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, that corresponds with, 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 with um, my, my foundation text in Isaiah 35, mm -hmm. where, where it talks about the fact that, that even in a desert, <laughs> roses blossom. And um, uh, I did some study in, in, on the desert rose. Mm -hmm. And the desert rose is a little different from the other roses that we see in our climates here that might need a lot of attention, a lot of water and all. The desert rose only needs one drop of water to, 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 to prosper. Wow. And when you trace it into the New Testament, um, it carries you into John with Nicodemus. Who, who was told by Jesus, you need to be born of the water and the spirit. And then the woman at the well who says, if you drink of this water, you'll never thirst again. And then when you get down to uh, chapter 7 in John, uh, Jesus says that the water is the Holy Spirit. And so uh, I wanted to ask the question, do you think as a part of us moving from uh, our positions of, of deficit in our relationship with Christ to a position of, of, of power and, and prosperity that we need to, to seek more of God's Holy Spirit and drinking from that fountain whom is Jesus so that he could help to reveal some of these? How, how does, you know, I heard you talking about your study, you know? Yeah, um what we've done, Dr. Paul, mm -hmm. is that we've literally chained the Bible back to the walls of churches. And people don't really believe that they can understand the Bible unless they have some academic to explain it, unless they have some commentary to explain it. But I found out that if we just spend time studying God's word itself, just reading and studying, God's spirit will come and interpret the scripture. Now, I worked in an academic community with all the guys with the degrees, okay? And I appreciate their scholarly work, but at the end of the day, true interpretation comes from the Holy Spirit. And if I always recommend to the saints that I pastored, you read your Bible through every year. And you read it through, not so that you can an answer doctrinal beliefs or become an apologetic for what you believe, but that you can breathe in the breath of God. You can understand God's mind because that's what prophecy is. It's actually God's mind. He's, what's the word? He's uh, giving him, giving revelation of himself. It's a self uh, disclosure. That's the word I was looking for. Yes. It was a, it's a self disclosure. And the more we get into the word, the spirit of the living God that you were just mentioning, the spirit of the living God comes in. He becomes the interpreter of scripture. And we begin to understand the God of prophecy. And when we begin to understand the God of prophecy, we'll see that God is always positive and he is always a God of abundance. Now, I know that people are saying, well, look at the bad things that have happened in the Bible and in the world. And God says, well, that's not my doing. But I want you to see that even in the evil that's happening in the world, my grace has kept the world from self-destructing. Matthew 5 and 45, God says, you know what? And no matter how bad the world is, I'm going to continue to give good to the world. My sun and my rain will continue to fall on the righteous and the unrighteous, the wicked and those that do good, because I want you to know, and this is God speaking, it's my goodness that leads to repentance, not persecution. Right. Romans 2 and 4 says, and don't you know that it is God's long suffering and goodness that leads to repentance? So God says, I'm going to keep doing good in the world. And yes, evil will have its place, but I want you to know that the good will always, my power will always overpower evil. Amen. That's prophecy. Yes. Well, um, tell us the name of that, that series again. Um, it's a uh, positive prophecy in a negative world, and it can be purchased on Amazon. Uh, uh, you can go to my website, 
www.homerunpreaching.com. Yes. www.homerunpreaching.com. And interesting enough, Dr. Paul, I actually have done this in an audio book and an ebook. And I'm excited about getting the information out. All right. So um, just send us uh, the, the link. Uh, we'll, we'll post it in our, our web uh, page and, and share it with others. Uh, maybe um, I can ask you to join us again next Friday. And maybe you could, if, you, if you're available, you could actually go into one of the prophetic passages that you deal with and give us a sample. Um, you know, sometimes oh, okay. when people sample stuff, and um, then I said, mmm, ah, this tastes good. Uh, you know, so if I'm you're looking you know, at my schedule right now, right, let's see where I'm going to be. Uh, that's the fourth. Yeah. No, no. You said, is it the fourth or the 11th? Um, let's see. T it, it would be the, it have to be about the fourth because the, okay. tonight is the 28th. Next Friday is the fourth. Yes. Um, let me look at my schedule again carefully. Um, but I, I'm going to try my best. Okay. Because I'm, I'm, I'm excited about empowering God's people with a prophetic word for this time. Yes. And I believe that the word is given through these books, positive prophecy in a negative world, will actually allow people to start in. I like the way you use the joy of prophecy. That's what you named the podcast. I want people to see the joy of prophecy and the sovereignty of a great God. Amen. You know, um, again, and in, in my wife and I devotion this morning, we were going and we were in, in Chronicles, Second Chronicles, I think, and and there was a series of of of, of um, a series of kings of Israel, and the Bible. Says, I didn't get that. Could you try again? Oh my goodness, Siri! <laughs> a series of kings um, who. Uh, were taught by their mothers to do evil. Mm -hmm. But that wasn't the point of the stories. The point of the story that there came a six-year-old who came into the forefront and did right. Did right. And 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 so sometimes you have to you have to present these um, scenarios that look bad. In order to make the good see how how it sh outshines yes. the bad, all right. And so, positive prophecy for these times. Uh, we want to congratulate you on that, and I, I'm sure that'll make an impact. And and we trust that people will go to Amazon and, and check it out for themselves and begin to not o not only read it but allow the the Holy Spirit to to help you to dig more into the Bible itself. As you, as you have said uh, earlier. So, Dr. Hill, we want to thank you for... One moment. Thank you for being here with us this evening. And um, say hello to your lovely wife for us. Yeah, we will. Thank you. And um, if it's possible, we'd be more than happy to have you on next Friday to give us a little sampling of uh, some of what you've done in the book and um, uh, so we can actually uh, taste and see how good... <laughs> the Lord is. So thanks again. God bless you. you. And I'm um, sure if, if listeners, if you want to uh, send a question to Dr. Hill, you can send it to us at any time. We'll pass it on to him. If you have a question that you'd like to ask, if you're on Facebook or on our YouTube page or um, wherever you're, you're tuning in tonight, feel free to, 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 to ask your questions and uh, let's uh, get them and we'll feel them to him that we can... Um, see what he has to say in that regard. We want to remind you or inform you, uh, listeners, that um, we're in the process of planning a 10-day prayer event um, in December, December 1 through 10, with a group in Canada. Uh, we hope we'll go uh, around the world, and we'll tell you more about it uh, in the very near future. So please uh, put that on your uh, mind and you'll be hearing more about it. And then um, wherever you decide to worship tomorrow, remember you enter to worship, but you are to leave to serve. All right? That's what God has called us to be servants. 
of the Most High God and to impact people's lives wherever we go. So we go to get inspiration, to, to, to be in, in energized and encouraged, but we leave to serve. That's what God has called us to, to be as his disciples. All right. And so we invite you to be with us again next week, Friday at 8 p.m. As we uh, begin the Sabbath, wherever you are, uh, we celebrate Jesus Christ, the Lord of the Sabbath and uh, the, the Savior of us all. Thank you again for joining us here on Discipleship Coaching 101. And if you want to be a good disciple, you have to spend time in the Word and let the Word permeate into your hearts and lives, soak into you so that you have something to, to, to spill out into the lives of others. God bless you. Happy Sabbath. Uh, tell somebody you love them. Uh, give somebody a hug tomorrow. Touch somebody. Make a difference. Be the difference. And uh, when Jesus comes, we'll all be a part of a great, big, wonderful family uh, up above. Happy Sabbath. God bless.